This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. This week's guest is Nick Maser, plant hunter, self taught botanist, rare species expert, and owner of Pan Global Plants, a nursery based in the Severn Valley, which, to quote the website, offers a selection of the finest, most desirable and often rarest plants capable of growing on these aisles. And that's key. Nick hand selects plants, in the past directly from where they were growing in the wild, and brings them into cultivation. He's renowned for choosing sublime varieties and for openly sharing his knowledge and experience. I did intend to talk to Nick a bit about his plant hunting trips, but as a stop has been put to these recently, due to rules around the transportation of plant materials, the conversation went in other directions. But he starts by talking about how he got into travelling around, looking at plants in their native habitats. I first got into it just through a, just through a desire to, just to get out and see plants in the wild. You know, you can read about these things as a young, keen horticulturalist. Um, uh, and there comes a time where you really want to start seeing it for yourself, start putting... Um, things into context so um i mean i did a little bit of tr- i suppose looking at well botanizing in the wild a little bit on on early holidays with my young family uh so that's kind of a little taster and then when i wanted to start heading further afield i would go to places like i'm trying to think now the first place i went to um south africa i did on my own and then started going to Mexico, uh, but with others. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, th- those sort of trips that take you really away and into some pretty amazing um, places with amazing plants, yeah. you know, that, that, that starts getting really inspiring. How did you learn botany? Was it something you taught yourself or was it something you studied? Well, there's a question. Um, I, I, I wouldn't ever describe myself as a botanist. I, I'm, a, I'm a sort of, I suppose, what you would call a sort of botanical horticulturalist. Uh, so with a keen interest in such things, but, but from a horticultural sort of um, background and, and basis. So, you know, so how did I learn? Uh, just through, I've learned what I've learned through, um, through reading, talking, research you know um i wouldn't call myself a taxonomist <laughs> you know it's like it's like dabbling in things isn't it you know you you can become quite good at some things just by having a keen interest i would say you know i would say that's how i've learned um i don't know if that's another one of your questions coming up but you know learning plants just learning plants just purely on passionate interest no one no one taught me all my plant knowledge i think that's a, i think i think that'd be the same for most plants people i think it has to be really well i think it probably does because i think they've stopped a lot of the um botany qualifications even so probably yes yeah yeah i've heard i've heard things but i don't know the, i don't know the detail no so when you set up your nursery did you set it up so that you had an excuse to keep doing all these trips and bringing stuff back or did you already have a nursery which you widened the remit of um I'm trying to think. Um, the uh, yes, I did have a nursery when I started. When I started going sort of plant hunting in earnest, I had a nursery already. But um, it, I, I'm trying to think back. It wasn't really. It wasn't really about plant hunting in those days. Um, plant hunting to collect seed, although we did earlier on in those early days. Um, it wasn't about collecting seed. It, I, I think it really was mainly like I was hinting on just now. The that's just the the desire to go and see plants in the wild, and to really understand how they uh, are, <laughs> you know, uh, what what they're interacting with, how they oh, sorry how how they're interacting together, how they interact with the landscapes, etc., etc., etc. That I mean that can really inform how you use them should we say uh in gardens i mean you, you know to a not just a visual way but also a um um what's the word um you know on a more ecological sort of um you know you know go, look at that thing there it's it's coping with six months of drought in in in, in pure 
broken rock, you know, that, wow, so that's a, clearly a very drought tolerant plant, for example. See what I mean? Mm. But also, like the visual side of things, going to see amazing sort of hillsides of Arbutus and Drachne, or I don't know, something uh, equally gorgeous, and you think, wow, God, why don't we plant 15 of those in a, in a group somewhere or surrounded by some, you know, cork oaks or, you know, it, it, sort of things you can do in the UK. Um, yeah, we can, we, can, we can do all sorts of our wonderful climate. And to see these uh, beautiful plants but, that you normally see one of here and one of there just about, you think, why don't we plant loads of them? Why don't we do incredible, beautiful things with rare plants? And why do you think we don't? Lack of inspiration. Lack of, this is exactly what I mean. You know, I think if you go and do, you go and do these things, you see them and you think, wow let's do it but i think a lot of people don't and they don't get that inspiration i mean obviously some of it is 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 fear of the unknown and ooh, apparently that's a bit tender uh you know but it isn't you know a lot of people assume unusual plants are tender that's something i i hear a lot at the nursery uh, they say well you know what can i some some local person might pop in that uh, not, isn't particularly um hell bent on interesting plants and they'll say oh i just i've got a spot to put something um um what should i put in there i say well what about this amazing thing and i said it's particularly rare and they say oh stop there no i don't want that uh i'm not interested in difficult to grow plants and i say no 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 (laughs) it's not difficult to grow because it's rare it's rare because it's rare you know there are multiple reasons where it might be rare but you know it's not about they're not difficult to grow necessarily at all. So people do have this idea sometimes that you know things they don't know might be tricky to grow. But it's often the case that rarities are incredibly easy. They're rare because they're you know difficult to propagate. It's, um, uh, they, they haven't been around. They've just been introduced, etc., etc., etc. So are the majority of the plants that you sell in your nursery are they hardy? Yes. Yeah. The majority of the plants I sell in my nursery are hardy, definitely. And so another thing, people, people often, I, I, I notice customers, people come, um, they come in and they and their eyes are drawn to these sighting things, which might be on the slightly more tender side of my range, and they, which is which is expectable, really. Um, I would probably do it myself. Oh, look at that exciting thing, and, and it happens to be. Uh, are one of the more, more tender things. So people do sometimes think, oh, yes, this is, this nursery is full of tender things, but it's not true at all. Most of my stock is, 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 is hardy across most of the UK. But I do like to do a range because, of course, there are places like Cornwall, you know, central London. There's all sorts of spots where there are all sorts of people, all sorts of gardens that can grow um, more tender things. So, And, of course, people like to experiment as well. Microclimates within... Uh, uh, gardens in slightly you know cooler places a good microclimate you can grow something that's slightly more tender so um, with climate change as well that gives us more opportunities to experiment so um, so I do arrange arrange mm-hmm. and you mentioned obviously some of these things are slightly more difficult or maybe more difficult to propagate how do you propagate the majority of the things that you bring back from plant hunting trips is it is it by seed uh, well, I don't, I don't, I don't bring anything back anymore because it's um, it's all um, the whole problem area with um, um, regulations and whatever. But uh, in the past, um, I have been um, uh, collecting seed. Yes, uh, clean, clean dry seed has been. You know, a pinch of seed here and there can go a long way. So it can be tricky, I presume, to get these things to germinate if you've got no experience of that. So is a lot of that trial and error. Uh, oh, you mean no experience of that particular species? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't say there's much. No, I, w- I would say you've been, you're mainly informed by your knowledge of um, that genus, um, for example. I mean, it's, it's quite rare that you, you will find something that's, that you have to really rack your brains to work out. I mean, once you once you start 
once you've sown a thousand different types of seed, <laughs> you start to get to know the general gist of things. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't say it's too much of a, a brain strain, really. Once, once, um, you're not not for a, for a professional nurseryman, really. And obviously, you mentioned that you can't bring things back now. Um, have, you know, you've got your collection at the moment as it stands. Uh, do you feel like you've you've got enough to be going on with, or are you you know are you kind of a little bit put out? Always, always looking for more. Always, always looking for more. And and and, but the thing is that, that in the UK there is an incredible amount of material already here and there's a lots of very obscure wonderful special things hiding away in specialist collections um as in i'm not i'm not talking about botanical gardens necessarily i'm talking about um private um plant nuts you know there's an incredible uh, wealth that we have here and then again there's also um hybridization you know creating new plants through um uh, hybridization so you know I, i'm currently fiddling around with creating hardy begonias uh, as a few of us are out there for example you know uh, plus other things you know um so then you know there, there, there are ways around still keeping fascinating new um plants uh um coming to the coming to the public you know um there's also selections to be made on on uh you know you raise a bunch of things from seed seed from cultivation and you start selecting very fine forms you know that 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 carries on as 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 it always has done so you know i do a bit of that as well naming naming plants and even you know hybrids um chance hybrids uh turn up my new mahonia that I i launched last year uh, was a chance hybrid from garden seed. Just happened to be two extremely rare mahonias um, um, uh, that produced a really, really good hybrid. And that's, you know, that's never been seen on Earth before. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a gorgeous looking thing. And uh, it came from UK seed, you know. So there's there's all sorts of opportunities. My, my new one is, um, uh, uh, wait for it, it's called <laughs> uh, Pan... Uh, and then there's a gap, and then Demic. So Pan as in Pan Global. I saw that, yeah, uh, <laughs> on you your website. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you know, it's a bit of a Marmite name. Don't know if everybody likes it, <laughs> but it had to be done. Yeah, fair enough. Listening to you speak, obviously, I think it's fair to say you would like to see more of these rarities in gardens. Um, and I think you know, if you're a professional gardener, you probably, like you said, you, you may want to plant these plants on mass. You may want to put them into a customer's garden. You can't get hold of them in any sort of quantities. If you do, they're very expensive. Uh, so does it, does the kind of, does it fall to the home gardener to get these things more widely grown or is it just never going to happen? Uh, well, firstly, I think it, it, it is going to happen. If, if, it, if people want it to happen, it can happen. And, and you know, secondly, um, n- not necessarily expensive at all. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're talking about buying um, some special, beautiful plants um, that aren't, you know, the, the, the rarest of all, you know, um, they're not they're not expensive certainly not from my nursery i mean any anyone anyone who knows the price of plants and who goes to garden centers and sees how much they are for commonly grown things mm. and then you start going to specialist nurseries and thinking no oh, actually they're not really very expensive at all i mean some some specialist nurseries do put the price there but i would say generally you know plants are a bargain quite frankly i mean you you, you could say oh you would say that but <laughs> but you know I, honestly, I, I do look at the market, uh, what's being sold at what price. I'm not going to mention any names, but it doesn't take much research to realize how how cheap um, a lot of specialist um, plants are. So I don't, I, so I don't buy that argument. Um, so I think you know, I think your other point was um, availability. Hmm. Um, so it is, yeah, it's okay having having things in numbers. If you wanted to plant a load of something, um, you would have to find the right amounts. But you know, <laughs> I don't know how many, uh, how many you're talking about, but uh, I think there's enough out there often to satisfy the demand of. Um, you know, I do have I do have some quality customers who are professionals who, who create gardens. 
Um, so, you know, they find they find enough to do that sort of thing. Yeah, I was thinking when I said about the expense of it, I think I was thinking if it went into, if it became very popular and you were saying it was difficult to propagate, then I'm guessing that would add to the cost of it. Yes, it, well, it would. Of course it would. Yeah. But you're still not talking about much. Mm-hmm. You know, I... I'm just trying to think of the, the 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 price of some really expensive things on the nursery. So say say a lot of my trees are say thirty five pounds, and that's a, a two liter tree. And if it's in a five liter, it might be forty five pounds, which um, you know for a whip of something common, obviously it's going to be really cheap. If you're talking about uh, a tree in a garden center, that's going to be uh, I don't know, that price or more uh, for something common. So if you're talking about a rare plant for 35 quid, a good tree in a two-litre plant, that's not expensive in any way. So if, if I was going to sell a really rare tree, and I'm talking very, very rare, possibly never been available ever before, literally, um, I have things like that occasionally, and I might charge you £50 pounds for that, or £60. Pounds. But I still wouldn't call that expensive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't. I think plants are, are cheap, really. Oh, so they, they are. They are undoubtedly cheap. We, we, I think, massively underpay for plants, if you think about the work that should go into producing them. And I think we'll yeah. probably find in the future that we do end up paying a lot more for the, or the correct price for plants, yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which like can, so. you know, get, be a good thing. <laughs> um, thinking about a plant that would make the grade for you, what you know? What makes a garden-worthy plant? What makes a really good plant, in your opinion? Or does it differ on what you're using it for? Wow, what a question! Um, <laughs> what makes a good plant for me? I mean, there's oh, uh, <laughs> there's so many different plants out there. <laughs> um, well, for me, I, let's try and distill this. Um, for me, the things that excite me, they have both. Okay, let's let's take it from this angle. So if I was to walk into a garden, the the most exciting gardens for me are where are where botanical interest and horticulture uh, combine. So good horticulture and and botany, botanical interest um, combine. So so um, or should I say design? So de- so good design and and fascinating plants that that to me is the is the is the high point so you know you can have a wonderfully designed garden so well this is you know this is feeding my soul visually uh, etc etc you know it's gorgeous but oh i know that plant i know that plant i know that plant i've seen them a million times before it, it only goes so far so it's, it's beautiful but it only goes so far uh, if you go in there and it's beautiful, and if you have the inclination to want to know what all the plants are, not everyone does. That's fair enough. Um, if you if you if you have that botanical side of that, that that interest in plants, uh, you want them really. Not always, but you want you want a lot of them at least to be interesting. Like, wow, I've never seen that before. Look at that. Oh my god, I've only seen that once in my life. Here it is growing in a dress or whatever, or in, a, in an unusual position, or you know what I mean. So it, that that to me is the I've forgotten the original question now, but <laughs> <laughs> what makes uh, a good plant? I think I'm, I'm still on the right lines, aren't I? So you definitely are, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm trying to now distill what you were saying. So, so it kind of almost is the novel that attracts you. But it sounded like what you were saying at the end there that sometimes it's when it might be out of context as well. Out of context? Well, um, I suppose so. I wasn't quite saying that, but I'm just trying to think um, that that could that could be relevant. Um, uh, well, I mean, gardens are so out of context normally, aren't they? Mm, they uh, are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a big. It's a quite a question. Um, yeah, it's a it's a funny one, isn't it? Things out of context. Um, what does that mean? Uh, like one monkey puzzle in a in a field. Yeah, that's out of, that's out of context, isn't it? Exactly. That. Uh, yeah. But then, then twenty five monkey puzzles at different heights in a field in different ages suddenly becomes not out of context mm. uh well far less so should we say you know what I mean yes it's an interesting thought I have to say and also it made me think when you were talking about seeing plants in communities and trying to you know plant in a slightly in a sense in a garden that that mimics that because that is what makes a you know to well 
for you, that's kind of what makes it beautiful is that it works ecologically and it sits obviously as it would in the natural habitat. Is there anything to stop us saying, okay, fine, well, then well, let's go and plant a plant community that you might find in a UK woodland? Would that have the same attractiveness? Uh, what? So you're saying like get a load of um, uh, native plants and put them in a garden? Mm. Well, I mean, what is a garden? You know, I mean, uh, so you've got a load of native plants um, and you're putting them together in, in, in a way uh, that would that nature would, shall we say, um, do in the, in, in the wild if left to its own devices. Um, uh, you have to ask yourself, what makes it a garden? Yes. So, yeah. So, so how, you know, how would we, so you, you, you're saying, um, get the, get those elements, those plants, and then, and then planting them in a, in a, um, a pleasing way. Yeah. I guess so. I mean, yeah. it, it was, I mean, it I mean was, there's nothing wrong with that at all. No, I mean, I mean, it just sparked it when you said about, you know, you, you'll, you'll see something in the wild growing and it just, you know, it works. And, and if we, instead of planting one rare shrub, we plant 15 and kind of make it look like it might in its natural habitat. Yeah. So so if I can just cut in there. So what I was saying there is it's not really about necessarily my, – so my, so my main point there was really about getting the most exciting things that I'm seeing and, and saying, I want that thing in my garden. Mm-hmm. Um, and if um, – just, just that that example was was about that, but also about say if I'm looking at the the amazing, um, I think I was talking about Ar- Arbutus and Dracony, wasn't I? So when you see that in the wild, hanging out of a cliff in Greece or um, wherever, and and the and the the peeling bark and the beautiful you know um, funky um, sort of. Um, um, form of the tree um the whole thing for me is just you know beautiful a lot of people you know would agree you know they, they love um um the nicest um arbutus um when you see that you think wow what a tree why don't we have to see that more often but so so if i were to plant it in my in my say if i had a large garden or a large garden to plant for someone if i planted one it would be great if i planted um, five or six or three here, one here, four over there, whatever. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then you start building up that community of, of special things, uh, of, you know, the, the, the finest things that make you excited. That, that, was, that was my point, really, rather than um, trying to go for the um, – yeah, yeah, that was, that was my point, really. It was, mm-hmm. it was more the – the, the the beauty side of it, but also the exciting side of it, which is the fact that you don't see it very often. Ah, oh, okay. So is anybody doing that well at the moment, in your opinion? Are you, do you mean designers? Or, yeah, or, or public gardens, any, you know, head gardeners anywhere? Uh, interesting question. Don't know. Um, uh, I'm put on the spot now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who's doing that well? I can't think. Um, I don't. I don't keep up with the with the design side of things um, uh, as much as I could do. I've just got my head in the plants all the time, so um, I can't. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. I'm sure. I'm sure there are some people doing a bit of that. Yeah, I can't think of who though. And do, do, have you got a garden as well, the nursery, or you've got your own garden? Do you kind of experiment with these things in a garden setting as well? I do. Well, at work, I've got within, within uh, the, the nursery is, is within a um, an acre walled garden, old walled garden, mm-hmm. and um, so half of it is um, um, nursery, and the other half is garden. So I do mess around a bit at work, uh, and at home, I've uh, I haven't been that particular property long enough to have created the garden yet but i've started the main the main thing there has been to keep the deer out first before <laughs> before I, I plant in earnest but i'm nearly there but it work yeah i i do i do mess around with things and a good example of what i'm talking about is that it can be found on the nursery at the moment i've got a got a raised bed area um made of um um, basically, uh, uh, sixty tons of Type One roadstone, which sounds horrific, but it's 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 in a, a pleasantly <laughs> curving curving shape. And uh, on that, I, I, I well, I, I dumped it there because I wanted sharp drainage, because my soil in in um, down by the Severn here uh, is 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 it's quite rich, sort of um, 
alluvial loam. So I wanted sharp drainage so I could start growing some exciting things that I've been finding on my travels. So there I planted um, well various things, but but in there at the moment I've got um, uh, some drifts of agaves, two different agaves that I found in Mexico back in the day. Uh, and they're so special. When you see them in the wild, they're just amazing, amazing, um, beautiful rosette forms. So agave ovatifolia would be one, and agave montana would be another. Uh, and I just thought, I have to grow these. And not just one poked in the corner uh, that everyone says, wow, that's a special plant. I wanted to plant lots. So my montanas, I've got something like, I don't know, five or six planted out on the end of this bed. And they're now, some of them are approaching sort of possibly, I think they're about nearly 1.8 metres across um, are, are the biggest. And one's coming up to flower this year um, for the first time. And then the other one will be, be agave ovatifolia with huge rosettes again with these silvery blue. Um, but again, I've got one here and I've got three over there. So when they, when they fill out, they become really really striking things you, you, i mean how many how many gardens in the uk can you see drifts of 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 full size mexican agaves not many so it, it's it's a sort of it's a sort of wow factor that that kind of thing excites me in gardens so you know so i think we need to be more brave and more bold with our plant choices well, it would excite me if, if everyone did. <laughs> <laughs> and, I don't know if that's relevant. <laughs> well, apart from obviously uh, Mahonia pandemic, um, if you had to say to somebody, okay, right, here's maybe two or three plants, go ahead, try them. They're brilliant. You won't regret it. What would you recommend? Oh, no. Oh, sorry. You put me on the spot. Everybody hates this question. <laughs> <laughs> I am useless at being put on the spot. <laughs> so, uh, what would you well, choose well, today? Tomorrow you can have something different. Oh, no. What would I choose today? My mind goes blank when people ask me. <laughs> Customers always say this sort of thing. What would you, and I go, oh, I don't know. Go out and have a look. Uh, <laughs> what would I grow? <laughs> ah! <laughs> so, um, 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 I told you I go blank. What? I've got too many plants. I've got too many plants. It must be something like 1,500 different types oh, out there. It must be um, hard. I could just say certain things that everyone gets excited about nowadays, like shufflers and things like that. Mm. But it seems too obvious and easy. Well, I've got um, really horrible clay soil. What if I wanted a shrub that I could plant a few of, group about? Um, it, it's wet. It's claggy. What could I? What would be really good? Wet and claggy? Yes. Right, so. Okay, so problem sites. Um, yeah. Maybe a Ramnus em emeritinus, something like something I've seen in the wild in um, in Georgia, Republic of Georgia. That's got huge. Um, so it's related to our native um, uh, Ramnus, um, which can be good for wildlife, of course. Um, but it has these huge, huge leaves in comparison. So it's so it's quite a striking um, foliage plant, really. So that's rarely seen. Uh, that would be a good one for that, those sort of conditions. Uh, but also maybe some of the more unusual um, willows, um, or even not so unusual but gorgeous willows. Things, things like Salix exigua, well, the coyote, coyote willow. Um, that's a beautiful, tiny little narrow silvery leaf. That's been around a long time, but isn't isn't grown enough. It does sucker, so you've got to be careful of that. But it's so gorgeous that most of us... Um, Forgive it. Um, what else would be good in your claggy wet soil? Um, uh, ooh, I'm just trying to think of I'm, certain things popping into my head, but they're too ordinary. I'm trying to think of rare things, aren't I? Special things. Um, well, I mean, I that's two good ones, to be honest. I'm, I'm impressed that you came up with anything unusual that would suit that. It's just the worst <laughs> site, so... Yes. Well, no. There's, there, there are lots of other things, but I'm just trying to think what they are. I don't do. I don't do a huge amount of things for for wet, wet, wet soils. But um, I'm just trying to think. I was just trying to think of something herbaceous to add to that there, to um, spread the. Um, but uh, I'm just sorry. I'm going blank again. Yeah, I, I did. Failed. Uh, well, I did throw a horrible one at you because most exotics would would not like those conditions, would they? Well, no, I have to go back again to the, my, my original point, which is um, 
Um, the, well, but I, I take it from by exotics, you mean just sort of rare plants. I suppose, because yes. A lot of, yeah, a lot of my plants, plants yeah. aren't what you call sort of exotic, exotic. Um, they're exotic to the UK, but um, they're not sort of, um, you know, tropical esque. You know, there's a whole range of things. Uh, but no, I would say that, you know, it's, it's like the hardiness thing. The nursery is full of hardy plants as well as a few tender things or semi tender things. And it's the same with. Um, the same with growing conditions as well not not just cold i mean um there's all sorts of things for all sorts of positions uh you know whether they're rare or not it really the rarity thing i just had to push that again the rarity thing has got nothing to do with growability so yeah you can find very unusual things that um that grow perfectly in really really difficult spots i'm just useless at being put on the spot sorry that's fine i will uh, direct everybody to your website immediately because <laughs> it's a good read yeah, well, as the, well the, the website is terribly out, out of date at the moment i have to apologize but I've, I've got a new one coming very very soon hopefully in the next um month or two hopefully out of date the website may be but you can still take a look through nick's fantastic catalog of plants and read about his plant hunting trips on the expeditions page Thank you to Nick for taking us on a meander through the world of rare plants, and to Olivier, who is Les Jardins d'Olivier on Instagram, for pointing me in the direction of Pan Global Plants. Thank you for listening. I'm leaving you now with Dr Ian Bedford, who has some information to impart, which may be relevant if you're a fan of the unusual when it comes to plants, particularly those ones that sometimes live under glass. As winter approaches, we'll probably begin finding that there's not so many demanding jobs to do in our gardens. And particularly on those cold, drizzly days with claggy flower beds and sodden lawns, there's a little less enthusiasm to be outside. So maybe it's a good time to focus our attention on some of our plants that might have been overlooked a bit during the summer months. Our house plants. Giving them a good clean and a feed as well as a thorough check over for any pests that might have moved in to infest them. Especially those small sap-sucking pests, such as aphids, whitefly and scale insects, whose presence is often accompanied by black sooty moulds that grow on the sugars they excrete on and around the plants. But a common sap-sucking pest to check for on the more fleshy-leaved indoor plants will be mealybugs of which there's a few species that occur in Britain. Although mealybug are rarely found on outdoor plants, as they've originated from the tropics and would be unlikely to survive a cold winter, they do very well all year round in our homes. And it'll be the pancake-shaped females that we'll find on our plants, being around four millimetres in length and clustered together in groups. Despite being pink in colour, they secrete wax from their bodies which not only gives them a light grey mealy appearance, but makes their infestations on a plant look like blobs of fungus or cotton wool. The male mealybugs, though, are quite different from the females, resembling tiny dark-coloured flies that are very short-lived and not often seen. Where mealybug infestations have become established, the groups of mature females remain immobile, whilst they produce waxy egg sacs that each contain around 200 tiny eggs. The eggs soon hatch into nymphs that resemble miniature versions of the female, although they're very mobile and rapidly disperse to infest new plants, sometimes hitching a lift on our clothing to new locations, where, remarkably, within just four weeks they'll mature and begin breeding. Although chemical products and a few biological control agents are available for mealybug control, infestations can be controlled manually by us if they're found in the early stages. Simply remove as many of the mealybug clusters as possible using a cocktail stick, then spray thoroughly with a proprietary soap-based product which will remove their wax and wash them from the plant. Repeat applications may then be needed to remove newly hatched nymphs over the following two weeks. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk Please also check out my Patreon where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. 
because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcasts.